بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم فلقد نوينا تعلم التعليم وتذكر وتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والدعاء إلى الهداء والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى الحمد لله It's a great honor to be here in such a wonderful gathering with so many people, so many new faces, with so many bright faces, so many smiling faces. It's a uh, one of the great gifts to be able to, uh, in these brief moments that we have before we uh, pray Isha, the final prayer of the day in Jama'ah, to hopefully explain and expand upon some of uh, what's one of the most uh, pivotal and central components of our faith. The title of Today's session, whether it's a dars or it's a talk or it's a, I don't know how best it would be articulated, but hopefully it would be something which will affect some kind of transformation, some kind of, something that to be activated within us. Uh, the reason why our shiuch and our teachers and all the way back to the Prophet wasalam, gathered in such gatherings was nothing other than to affect this within the soul so that we gain a proximity and a closeness back to our source back to the meaning of all this, back to our purpose and understanding what this is ultimately all about. So the title is The, uh, po the Polished Heart. It is a really interesting title uh, because implicit within the title is there are a multitude of different types of hearts, different varieties of hearts. And what do we mean by this? Although it looks like something out of an anatomy the, the medical class, the poster, we're not talking about the physical heart, we're talking about something which is perhaps metaphysical, or in some ways figurative, but it's a reality. It's a reality, it's something which is real, it can't be ha apprehended or understood empirically, it can't be tested for, you can't screen it, you can't go to a local hospital and um, study it, however it exists. And in many ways, its, its impact upon our being, our presence, is far more profound than even the physical heart. The physical heart, which we can feel pumping, pumping within our chest, uh, is finite. Yet the heart which we'll be speaking about this evening is infinite. And it has the potentiality to be refined and to be cultivated. There's something within every single one of you which has this potentiality, Allah has locked within it. And it's through the cultivation, through the refining of this heart, that it becomes polished. Why do we need a polished heart? Even the metaphor seems kind of strange. Why would you need to polish something, a part of your anatomy or a particular organ within your body? You know, even if it's figurative, what do we mean to be polished? Why, you know, typically that which we polish is that which we need to reflect, and that's exactly what it's about. Ultimately, the higher echelons of the, the spiritual tradition within our faith, it's about reflecting the divine realities in creation. Now, what does that all mean? The Prophet ﷺ came to connect people's hearts back to the source, to wake us up, to bring us back to tasting, experiencing, at the very least appreciating something that we were, we were created for a greater purpose. The Qur'an so beautifully mentions the Qur'an in many instances. <coughs> if we look in terms of its reference to, to the remembrances, this is the, the, the locus by which divine remembrance can be understood and internalized. <laughs> is it not with the authentic remembrance of God that hearts truly find tranquility? And this is one of the things which we have in common with the entire human race. That people feel pain. It's not something which is uh, specifically for people of faith or belief in Allah or any other religion. 
we all share this understanding of pain and if somebody we find many expressions even within the English language uh, which relate to the heart you know, he, he or she or they or it broke my heart and it's soothing to the heart it's, it's soul food all of these kind of uh, expressions in the English language pertain to a reality which in a modern context many of us have become so detached and we, it, we, it's, it's hard to now try and fathom the coordinates in which to understand what it is we're actually talking about. We all know what it is but we don't know what we're really talking about and how can you cultivate that which you don't know? How can you refine? How, to give an example, if somebody was uh, wanted to start doing weights in the gym, but they didn't have a methodology, they didn't have a, a way to do things, typically they'll end up hurting themselves. You know, they'll be putting too much strain. And this can also happen in an authentic spiritual quest, that sometimes people all too often burn out. And some of the worst displays of humanity can be through the prism of a pseudo-religiosity when people in fact use the religion, use the literal divine uncreated word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an or the prophetic traditions, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and the hadith, his blessed sayings in order to embellish the ego and to, to really use, the ego uses this to, for its own means. Now, if we look at the heart, the Prophet sallallahu explicitly reference its centrality to our faith. And it's interesting because all too often we're talking very much about identity. There's something which seems to be very much upon the tongues of many Muslims today. We pride, pride ourselves as, as Muslim youth to be people that are very much in tune with our identity or at least on a quest in order to discover uh, what this identity is all about. But this is actually a very uh, contemporary concept. The Sahaba, I don't think, had discussions or uh, you know, evening workshops discussing what their identity was. They very much knew who they were. In terms of ethnicity, they were very much Arab. They knew their tradition. They had certain cultural and uh, customs and habits and traits. However, this wasn't to uh, dilute their Islam. When Islam came, it, 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 it illuminated the, enti uh, the entirety of all those early generations. So much so you have expressions of that from other cultures. The great Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi, the great Sayyidina Bilal al-Habashi, all of them were included in this new identity which was not defined upon skin color. Whilst respecting, whilst apprehending, and not only tolerating but in fact celebrating the beauty of the diversity within the, through the prism that it's all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this wasn't the crux. This wasn't what it was ultimately all about how you project yourself to the outward world, how you camouflage yourself and uh, come across to people at, you, at the workplace or at school, and so on and so forth. Rather, it was something much deeper. The prophetic message came to connect us to that, which, that, that aching part within us which knows there must be something bigger, there must be something more profound. And coming from a, a, a life without Islam, I embraced Islam, I became interested around the age of 15 and took my shahada at the, at the age of 18. Uh, it's a very lonely existence when there is no God in the universe and you're the only one and you're in charge of your destiny. The claim of individuality and having control of your own destiny is actually uh, all too often uh, not really, doesn't really meet the mark in practical life. If you look at many expressions of this within contemporary societies, and this is we often talk about the Western world, but it's not something which is now contained or confined to a particular jiha, a particular direction or geographical uh, place. It's, it's a state of being. Maybe you could articulate it as the, the move, moving away from traditionalism, from a classic paradigm or understanding of the world into modernity. When we're so fractured and fragmented, we have this awkwardness we lack this ease in our existence, in being. This idea of being, and this is why you have people parading in the streets, particularly as we saw in Sydney, doing the early morning yoga, in an attempt to try and reclaim something of that humanity, which somehow has been lost through the traffic jams, and the endless news feeds, and the fake news, and everything else, which is purporting itself to be of absolute relevancy, but our heart is telling us that it's not. 
there's something deeper. The Prophet ﷺ came to a society which in many ways was uh, one of the most parochial societies which existed at the time. It didn't have the diversity which you would have found in the Persian Empire, although it was in its decaying final expressions of that great dynasty. It still had, it was a place of immense diversity in terms of there were different ethnic uh, uh, races within that uh, particular geographical direction, there were different languages, there were different ways of thinking, there were different religions. Same within Rum. So if we look in terms of modern day Turkey, this was governed under, as we know, by the Byzantine Empire. And this is where many of the people there, there was, a, there was an influx of you know, the Holy Roman Empire, people coming from Europe and different parts of the world. And slap bang in the middle, you have, as they were referred to in a derogatory sense, as the lizard, eater, lizard eaters, these kind of inconsequential, slightly irri irritating uh, group of desert nomads, which never really meant anything to the people. They had no profundity. They weren't a people of any kind of technological or societal advancement. They were just kind of this awkward middle space in between these two great empires. But from this, from this came this revolution. And it wasn't something which was narrowed in a very contemporary and this into a political um, or a social revolution. It was something which is literally redefining the way humanity perceived the world around it. You know, the Arabs were a highly tribal people and one of the first things in order to establish some sense of humanity within a society there has to be law, there have to be coordinates, you know, because it's only through that that you can have an authentic um, redressing of people's rights and responsibilities and duties. Other than that, you just have chaos. So when the Prophet وسلم, came, he came with this message. But what he addressed وسلم, primarily was the heart and the soul. The intellect in its understanding of it within an Islamic context was never reduced to something that we should not be interested in. And this is why the pursuit of sacred knowledge is primarily one of, of mind and intellect. You, you have to have an intellectual acumen. And this is why the scholars, the great <coughs> professors of this tradition, were people that were respected. Because this is something which is not Kespi, it's Wahhabi. You can't really ultimately improve your intellect. It's either something you have or you're not. Or you don't. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in the Quran, kuntum la ta'lamun. Ask the people of knowledge, dhikr, a certain type of knowledge, knowledge which is infused with divine remembrance. It's not infused with, with ego and lowly desires. If you know not. You know, so this in, implicit uh, humility is one of the essential underpinnings of our approach to this faith. However, the intellect in the prophetic paradigm, the way the Prophet ﷺ would teach us, was not to be worshipped. We would celebrate it, but it was also to be appropriated, meaning it's a tool. And as with a hammer, you can use it to construct a wonderful message, just as the one that we've just prayed in, or you can use it to, to destroy or even kill. So how do we understand the correct usage of this tool? How do we apply? We need to have a methodology. You know, and what's the purpose of the tool? Why do we need this? The traditional understanding was ultimately it would be to, to recalibrate the mind. So we start to see the world in an authentically prophetic manner. What does that mean? If that starts to take place, it, it unlocks something deeper. This is uh, referred to in Arabic as qalb, fu'ad. There are different expressions, and some of the scholars would uh, distinguish between the various articulations or translations where in a kind of reductionist way the English language just says heart. We also have the concept of the soul. Is there a difference between the heart and the soul? Some of the scholars said yes, although they, were very, they had a precaution in overly embellishing their understanding of what the soul was. It is from the affair of your Lord, as the, the Quran so exquisitely uh, proclaims. You also have the sir, which is this deep, intrinsic reality within you, which ultimately is that which makes you human. It's the place in which the prophets, salam, would receive wahi, divine revelation, this deep, essential component to your humanity, the deep secret.
It's the place where the awliya and the great saints of this tradition, people that reached a level of polishing, of purity of heart, where, whereby they were able to apprehend. It's not, it's not wahi, it's not revelation, but it's something called ilham. The Prophet he said, indeed in my ummah you have people who are mulhamun, and Sayyidina Umar was one of them people of divine inspiration, people of guidance, people that Allah takes by the hand and navigates them and you know, on their path back to Him in every decision that they make. These are the kind of people which Allah calls us to be around and spend time with and be present with. So the Prophet ﷺ, within this context, he was, you can imagine these early gatherings amongst the Sahaba in the living rooms of Mecca. And, uh, the Iman was incredibly fresh and they were just uh, completely in awe of this, you know, this revival which was taking place, which was experienced to the level of their heart, their souls. It wasn't just something which they were interested in, to kind of take a course on a kind of academic, somewhat abstracted understanding of Islam. This was something which was touching them and transforming them. We can't underestimate the power of what it means for somebody to take a 180 uh, redirection, recalibration from a life of complete disbelief in a, in, in a divine reality to belief and apprehension and even experience of what this means. You know, and he is close, uh, and he is closer to you than your jugular vein. And the scholars are very cautious to say this isn't comparative. It doesn't mean Allah is like your jugular vein. Many, many, many people may make the erroneous assumption and lead to the but it's like the jugular vein, this kind of carotid artery within the neck of the human being. Very graphic, very powerful analogy. What could be closer to you than your carotid artery? But Allah is closer. How close? Incomparably closer, uniquely closer. Were you to say it's like the jugular vein, you actually come out of the fold of Islam, strictly speaking, because you're comparing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to something of His creation. And it's not just in a particular mode or a particular time or a particular place. Right now, He's closer to us. Right now. And this imminency, if. Well, we're not going to unpack the, the theological implications within this particular session. But the, that closeness, that feeling, that apprehension of the divine is something which the early Muslims were very, very keen to, understood, to understand. And they tasted this because of the light of the Prophet He said in the filjisati la mudgha Indeed, in the body there is a, a, a mudgha which is kind of like slightly um, unimpressive lump of flesh, piece of meat, this, this kind of deadened organ residing within the, the human chest. But the Prophet ﷺ very quickly alluded to this was not what was being apprehended. This is what was, wasn't what was being discussed about it. Some of the scholars would say that the, the, the metaphysical heart was located in that, in that location. However, there's something more profound, there's something deeper. إِذَا فَسَدَتْ إِذَا سَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ جِسْمُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ جِسْمُ كُلُّهُ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ If it's rectified, if it's purified, if it's cultivated, if it's refined, if it's polished, then the entire body, not just your limbs, not your outer extremities, become nice and purified and right, the way you think the way you see the world, the decisions that you make, your relationships with your spouse, your children, your parents, the broader society, everything by implication thus becomes purified. What either fesadet and if it becomes polluted, soiled, fouled, the entire body so too becomes polluted and fouled. Fesadet, it becomes putrid, <coughs> festering in in, in disarray and, you know, and this is what happens, one of the, one of the uh, real symptoms of modern human beings is we're so interested in fulfilling the desires of the self yet we've become so detached from ourselves we don't quite know really what we are or if there is even a, such a thing as what we are. Truth has is, is become this abstracted somewhat cosmic thing which people pontificate about in universities within the realms of uh, uh, classes in theology and philosophy, but what does that mean? How does it impact us? The 
Prophet وسلم, his tradition, his religion, his way was for all hum humanity. Every previous Prophet was sent individually to their own peoples. However, I was sent forth to, to all of humanity. And in another narration, I was sent forth to all creation. Everything. He was teaching everything to get back to its source. How to reconnect back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah wa hiya al qalb. Is it not the heart? If the heart becomes purified, everything becomes purified. If the heart becomes putrid and foul and we neglect the heart, everything else becomes thus. Now, one of the things we have to apprehend that living in a you know, once again, apprehensive to say a Western society, a modern paradigm, a view of the world, you know, where, where we worship the realms of academia, and often the professor is a modern-day priest, or every doctrine which they, you know, relentlessly, you know, kind of give to us, we take in wholesale and we, and we, we follow. That's this is this is somewhat problematic in our tradition because we have to understand that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came with a holistic methodology. We don't abuse the mind. The mind is in many ways sacred because it has divine origins. The aql is that which you're bound to, doctrinally, your creed. And this is why the expression of Islam, an iman, an ihsan, is so pivotal in our holistic understanding of our deen. You can't have one over the other. And if we start to become imbalanced and focus purely on the extremities, on the how-to, and we forget the why, then even the how-to now becomes imbalanced and people lose the himma, lose the reason why they need to be praying even in the first place. Islam is the how-to. How do we pray? How do we fast? How do we pay our zakat? How do we go on the, the pilgrimage to the holy... Uh, Ka'aba for those that are able to find a way. Iman is that, once again, that recalibration of the intellect, the honoring of the aql. How do we understand and determine what we believe, what we understand? It's this, you know, cognitive faculty to comprehend. But then you also have a component which, in many Muslim circles, unfortunately today, has been largely neglected. In the the, the, the hadith of Sayyidina Jibreel as we all know when he came and he placed his, his knees directly to the knees of the Prophet when asked what is when he asked what is Islam what is Iman when, when he asked what is and what inform me about Ihsan the prophetic definition was an ta'budullah ka'annaka tara. It's to devote yourself to Allah as if you see Him. And if you don't see Him, to know that He sees you. That's the, defi the prophetic definition of spiritual excellency, perfection in one's, you know, of a polish, polished heart. That's what it results in. Now, if a person starts to feel this, what they call mushahada, in the, the art or the discipline of, of prophetic tazkiyah, refinement of the heart, refinement of the soul. Mushahad is this witnessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This kind of person is going to be have a very interesting uh, life, the way they apprehend things around them, the decisions that they make because they're constantly in this state of witnessing the divine. The scholars then, what they would do is by through inheritance from the Sahaba عنه, is they were able to categorize and codify it. so we're able to have sit here now in Melbourne in 2018 and understand that the Prophet وسلم, did not leave us without a blueprint he didn't leave us without methodology everything that we need to know he didn't fail in the, in the slightest of ways to, to give the most beautiful and clearest of ways. I've left you upon a very clear path. Its night is as, it, is as its day. None wavers from this path except the person of perdition, the person who is ultimately destined 
not for paradise or eternality, but it's a very clear way. Now, what does that mean to us? It's interesting that one of the, uh, you could say, the symptoms, perhaps, of, of a modern uh, articulation of our being, our state, is, is purely reduced to the mind within the realms of psychology. It's, it's, it's understanding and analyzing, quantifying symptoms. And then trying to work around some kind of you know, um, method based upon those symptoms for, cu for a cure, for a healing. Sometimes this works, sometimes it ca almost catastrophically makes, m misses the mark. But one of the things that we have to understand in our tradition is everything is rooted in the heart and rooted in the soul. Any psychological ailment is ultimately rooted in a spiritual and pours forth from a spiritual reality, either in a harmony or a disharmony. Why is this once again important to us? Well, the Prophet as we've heard, he said that it, this is really the pivotal, the central component to what it means to be human. And everything that you do or don't do, every decision you make, your entire life is dependent upon the rectification of this component of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran on that day that neither wealth nor children will avail them save the one that comes to Allah bi qalbin salim with a, with a sound heart, a purified heart not an impressive intellect or a high IQ a sound heart and this is why there's always been this um, divine fairness that you see without humanity were faith to be purely restri restricted to the level of, of intellect, intellect, you'd have a number of Cambridge or Yale, Harvard University professors um, that would all be believers in the general masses would, would not be able to understand this. But you don't have this. You have some of the most atheistic expressions within the realms of academia, some of the most powerful and impressive intellects on the planet. And you have the, some of the most simple of people that have this light of faith within their hearts. This is part of the, the beauty of our tradition, that it's not, um, uh, as, you know, as, as, as we mentioned, the Prophet وسلم, he came to all of creation. It wasn't to a particular race or ethnicity or type of person. It was to all humanity. It's uh, a challenging title in some ways to unpack because I was very cautious that there was the claim there that the person giving the talk has any kind of, in, you know, there's any kind of polishing that's taken place. We're a tradition that typically uh, we're not to speak about those things which we haven't attained or apprehended. Um, however, uh, after becoming Muslim, uh, and experiencing something of that, that change experience, experientially at the level of the heart. It really moved me to go and seek out those people that could do the polishing because there was some serious work that needed doing. So where do we go? Where do we, where do we turn to? Because we have the blueprint, we get the understanding that this is the whole point. But where do we go? Where do we head to? Well, the Prophet he would never call us to something other than he gave us a methodology to reach it. He gave us this, there was this preservation of these prophetic coordinates back to this, this great ends. He said, The scholars, meaning the true, authentic scholars, people of, of knowledge, people of khasha, people with those attributes of authentic scholarship, humility, generosity, Humbleness, kindness, fear or apprehension of the divine in their practice. People that practice what they preach. People whose hearts are in, in a state of trepidation and awe in their, 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 their relationship with the divine. You know, they are the true inheritors of the prophets. Al-ulama warathat al-anbiya. The scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. And we're also in a time now where there's, there's much claim to knowledge. 
and we often, as, as, as lay people, we fall into the trap of thinking that anyone that can profess or quote half an ayah or a portion of a, of a prophetic hadith should now be given some kind of uh, reverence or be heeded to. We do well to look in terms of the history, purely from a factual perspective of the ummah, that any, any uh, uh, group that ever went astray and was misguided often articulated their misguidance through the prism of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. You know, we, we guide many people by it and we lead many people astray by it. We have to understand the first articulation of taqwa, of true uh, awe and fear and God consciousness within the Qur'an, hudan lil muttaqeen. It's a guidance for people of this authentic consciousness and awareness and fear, awe of the divine. What's their first characteristic? Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghaib. It's those people which have a belief in the unseen. Not superficial people. Not people which use their knowledge for the sake of to, you know, worldly fame. Because the nature of the nafs, the nature of the ego, is it inclines towards you know, money, it inclines towards fame, it inclines towards notoriety. And that's completely unbefitting for those people which are claiming to do this in the name of re religiosity. What's the, what's the reason for that? Why does the, why does the ego want uh, fame or notoriety? The scholars say, say it's because the ego wants to be eternal. Is this deep want within every single one of us to live forever. And you see the materializing of this, in, you know, uh, they call it the race to 2030, where there's this, some projections they think you can um, upload your consciousness into a, some kind of, you know, you know, you're soon awaiting AI machine and you can live forever. <coughs> Walt, Walt Disney froze himself in the, in the, in the hope that he'd be resu resuscitated. But all of these ideologies, ha ideologies have a genealogy. They go back to something. If we look at Pharaoh, same idea. He just wrapped himself in ban bandages because they didn't have access to liquid nitrogen or whatever was available at the time. But all of these things are inherited. Everything's been inherited. And the Prophet ﷺ bequeathed to those people around him uh, sacred duties and preserved within them realities of the heart. This was then bequeathed, given, passed on to that blessed generation which took and derived their knowledge from the Sahaba, the Tabi'in. And those realities of prophecy will be maintained in the Ummah until the Qur'an is lifted. But how do we find those people? How do we understand who the true ulama are? How do we go to them for our source of knowledge? If we're commanded in the Qur'an, as we mentioned, فَسَأَلَ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge, of true uh, uh, knowledge which is imbued and, 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 and uh, cradled with divine remembrance, if you know not. How do we distinguish those people that a false claim from a true reality? The first uh, stage on this quest, which the scholars of this kind of masters this tradition would talk about, would be uh, to engage in an authentic toba. Now, toba is often translated somewhat clumsily as uh, repentance, but that often borrows from a kind of a baggage from other religious traditions, which uh, an authentic expression of Islam does not uh, ascribe to. Tawbah is related linguistically to this turning back. It's also where you have inaba, this kind of like movement back into devotion. That you were on the Sirat al Mustaqim and you're somehow diverted for a period of time. And it's that moment of apprehension that I'm going off on a tangent. And it could be catastrophic, have catastrophic implications that I actually need to return back. This is the first moment of that kind of cognitive awareness, this consciousness that you're a person of purpose, of meaning. And what happens here is it starts to illuminate the heart. It activates something within the soul. So the polished heart is ultimately a person that's gone through this process. There are many definitions for this science in, in our tradition. Some of them would, there would be different forms of, of, of uh, how they would articulate its meanings. Sometimes it would be descriptive. 
It's uh, a tahalli ala radail wa tahalli bin fadail. It's literally to um, rid oneself of foul attributes and inculcate one's, within oneself praiseworthy attributes. Now, within that definition is this indication that it's a process, it's a journey. The polishing takes place. One of the things that's ascribed to uh, one of the great Konyans, Maulana Jalaluddin al Rumi, Wallahu alam, I don't have the Senate. So, but you get it on the occasional meme which floats about on social media uh, that if you are irritated by every rub how will you ever be polished? Now the meaning is true because if we understand that every difficulty that we have in our lives every challenge which faces us any decision which sometimes can seem crippling or suffocating before us is ultimately directly from the divine construction it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sculpting us and maneuvering us and redirecting us and designing us to unlock something within the heart of what you could be. Now, oftentimes we don't even know that. More often than we don't know. But Allah knows. And this is part of this process of inculcating these praiseworthy attributes. Like what? Like acquiescence to the divine promise. To know that Allah's, Allah didn't lose control. Any challenge that we have in our lives was exactly as it was supposed to be. But the Prophet ﷺ, he also taught us how to be human, authentically human, in all of these moments, in all of these tests, in all of these trials. One of the scholars said that we so desperately need the Prophet ﷺ because he always reminds us of what it means to be human. We live in a time now where there are increasing um, variables within the definition of humanity. We're not going to go into it, but in terms of the various expressions of gender. Somebody mentioned that there were over 72 categories at the end. It was a tick boxing other in, in a Western university. And this is, uh, we're not going to make a comment on this, but this is just a very least we can derive that this shows a, a real departure from traditional apprehension and understanding of what it means to be human or what it means to be male or female or masculine or feminine. And this creates an element of trepidation at the level of the soul. We don't really know, we don't really have a foreground in which, in which to, 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 you know, to move from. But the ultimate polished heart is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Because we are a tradition of definitions and we're a tradition of coordinates and we're a tradition of clarity. Our only understanding of that which is good or that which is bad is in direct correlation to its closeness to the Messenger of Allah or its distance from him. Good character ultimately means uh, closeness to the way and the demeanor and the behavior and the character of the Messenger of Allah Bad character is that which he called away from, that which he didn't do, that which he, he found fault in. So he is our standard, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's interesting if we, if we come full circle and we look at how we praise ourselves often as Muslims in our identity, it's how we project ourselves outwardly. But the prophetic way is ultimately it's to redirect that, not just on a linear level, not to neglect the social um, you know, component to our deen, but if it's not rooted in that which is meaningful, that which connects us ultimately back to the celestial and ultimately back to Allah, then we won't know how to interact with other people. And we see this, perhaps within the levels of our own selves, perhaps within our, our families, the decisions that we made, the things that we said, perhaps a moment of, of temper or anger that's expressed that we wish we could have taken back. But this isn't contained, unfortunately, within the realms of, of, of our homes. It has an expression within our communities and ultimately our societies and the broader ummah. But the call back to a real revolution, a real you know, authentic, prophetic uh, progr progressiveness starts with the heart. We're in a time now where we, you know, we, we're, we're a fast food uh, we want fast food religion, 
the news feed that which we're, we're feeding ourselves intravenously from the, the dark annals of cyberspace is, uh, is, is poisoning us. And it's warping and conditioning the way traditional Muslims would apprehend everything around us. We're being conditioned. That's why we need to be very careful because the scholars of this science would often talk about being very weary and having this cognitive awareness of that which you're allowing into your soul. What does that mean? What do you look at? What do you see? What do you allow? If you know, and this, if you know if something is haram, why allow this into your heart? If you, if you listen to something, if someone is backbiting, which you know ultimately it doesn't take a great spiritual acumen to understand that backbiting another human being typically results in hurt and harm and doesn't really help for cohesion within a society. But this takes training. This takes what they call tarbiya, which is indicative also of this perhaps even a lifelong process. Our teachers would often say that Allah only initiates, because this isn't a cult, it's not a, a club, this is something which is accessible to all believers. If you have a heart, then this is accessible to you. But it takes that motion, and that, that tawba, that, that inaba, that, that recalibrating, that movement back to authenticity, to purpose, to meaning, has to come from you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to uh, traverse this, this path and engage in this journey. I'm sure many of you are already engaged very much in this journey. We met some wonderful brothers before. We're very honored to be in their company and in, uh, you know, seeking sacred knowledge. Sacred knowledge is one of the great lights to the heart that illuminates the heart. We're here with Sayyid Sanim, Mawla Dawina, mashallah, one of our teachers from Tani, uh, who spent many years in, in this blessed land. And you have people like this in, 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 in this community, it's a great honor, it's a great privilege you know, to be amongst these people. Because the, you know, we're, we're people, we're very much result-based now, as, you know, you know, we have to, we have to, well, what, what does this all mean? Okay, nice polished heart, what's the big deal? Well, the result is Jannah. And, and, the, and the default physics of Jannah is فيها ما لا عين رأت ولا أذن سمعت ولا خطر على قلب بشر Within it is that which no eye has ever seen No ear has ever heard It's never occurred to the human heart And our teachers would say this was, this was constantly renewed This wasn't that you just go to Jannah and after a while you come like kind of like acquainted, get slightly bored of that which you was never seen before. And then, no, this is constantly renewed. In every moment it's that which no eye has ever seen. And then you see that and oh, I never saw that. Before. And it keeps on replenishing. This is the greatness of Jannah and the ruh, the soul, the heart, in that reality, in that domain, is given the capacity to experience joy. May Allah allow us to try to engage with this great tradition and upon this path and upon this journey and the barakah that we've all gathered here today inshallah seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking meaning seeking purpose nobody was forced here and ultimately it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which allowed us to be here through his idhan you know to share this space and share these moments in a time where most people are not interested or not even aware about what the heart even means what, what are we talking about here Will it help me to get a degree? Will it help me to increase and push my salary? Will it help me to get out a bigger house? Is that really why we were created? Is that really the great purpose of humanity? What we're all here to do? The Prophet said, true enrichment and fulfillment is at the level of the soul. May Allah enrich our souls tonight, inshallah. And bind our hearts together. And create love between us. And not only tolerance, but, but celebration of our differences. One of the great things we heard as well, that this, this mosque is actively concerned about bringing you know, various different ethnicities and, and peoples in. We can see that's wonderful, because that's an authentic expression of Islam. Our identity is our devotion to Allah. Not ultimately the color of our skin, or our accent, or our language. And in this we're bound, and in accordance to our proximity, and actualization, realization of this meaning, we become true brothers. Allah says, indeed, the, be the believers are ikhwah. 
And Echwa is interesting because actually what it means is a, is it's a, it's a brother, uh, uh, the, the, the word for, for brotherhood in terms of for fraternity is Ikhwan. There are two ways of articulating brotherhood. But Allah doesn't say that. Allah says Ikhwa, which means blood brothers. That the believers, the, the power of that faith which just, you know, moves people and binds people is so potent. It's, it's like you're stronger than blood brothers. It's one of the great gifts of our deen, you know. This is apprehended by the heart. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you all. I appreciate you listening, you know, having the opportunity to be here. It's been a great honor. Very wonderful masjid, mashallah. Very peaceful. I felt like we were walking into Istanbul, mashallah. It was wonderful, mashallah. It was wonderful minarets. Subhanallah. Absolutely wonderful, mashallah. The, the, the Turks were people of Zulk. Zulk. Mm. People of this deep, in English we say good taste. So they, have, they have good taste. And it's normally confined to like somebody who's able to, they're, they're, a, they're a good dresser, which the Turks often have as well. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. But it's actually more profound in our tradition. They have this spiritual ability to, to, to experience beauty. And it's one of the things that's attributed to Mulana Jilanadin al Rumi, that he, when he came from Balkh, in the far region of the, of the, you know, Mawara and Nahar, and he came to the Turkish people, the people of Anatolia. One of the things that he understood is that these were a people which understood beauty. And he said, and then I knew that my way to call them to Allah was through beauty. You know, we're in a time where we need to be conduits to articulate this beauty to people. You know, and the, we, فَاقِدُوا شَيْلَ يُعْطِي If you don't have something, you're not able to pass it on. So may Allah allow us, our hearts to be polished and that we can apprehend the beauty and radiate and reflect the beauty of His Prophet and to all of humanity. It's a time where people are in real need and people are looking for examples. People are looking for role models. People are looking for a, a practical, applied way to be a greater human being. And the Prophet came with all of this and more. So may Allah allow us to connect to that perfect, polished heart and that pristine, profound, beautiful, soul in which there is no soul more unique, no soul more precious, no soul more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that He is the, the pivotal factor. He is the reality. Closest to Him is, is, is closest to Allah. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمْ Allah. Teacher, he said recently, uh, in, you know, exp explaining this verse, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ Say if you truly love Allah. It's not just a claim. If there's an authentic love within the soul, فَتَّبِعُونِي Follow me. يُحْبِبُكُمْ Allah, And Allah will love you. And he said that the, 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 the flow of the verse, in, you know, in terms of, it, it flows of, say if you truly love Allah, then follow Allah. Or obey Allah. He doesn't say that. So follow me. And then the flow from that verse, in terms of the way, the, the, what they call the, the, the linguistic motion of the, of the verse, follow me and I will love you, but it doesn't say that, it says follow me and Allah will love you. So you can see how intertwined the realities of following Rasulullah is to the divine love. May Allah expose our hearts to these realities, connected to, to those people that can teach us this with their, their states prior to their words. وَصَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِ الْمُحَمَّدِ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَمِ الحمد لله رب العالمين